Well, here we are right on time today. Welcome to Love and Lordship, and I'm your host, Greg Williams, and we thank you for joining us, sharing us, and encouraging others as we desire to see them walk in their life and their relationships, their families, and beyond in the love and lordship of Jesus Christ. So we're going to continue our discussion this week on the loving disciplines versus the lustful desires. You like that alliteration? That's good, isn't it, right? Okay, I get every once in a while I get something right. Loving disciplines versus lustful desires. The former is the core and the foundation of building great relationships for Christ and in His kingdom, even building His kingdom. The latter does nothing but destroy lives and relationships, and we want to make sure that we're fighting against those attempts to destroy the kingdom. Okay, So I'm going to do that today. Uh, through a story of a couple that I've worked with, and then through another individual that I mentor who sent me an email and some really tough stuff, but some really good things have come from it. You see, much of our culture has equated love and lust. Let me say that again. Equated love and lust. They confuse the two. They define all our relationships by feelings, which is where lust ultimately comes from, rather than the affections uh, rooted in commitment, which is what love actually is. Notice that there are emotions in both. It's just that the emotions don't rule in love. They are part of the product of love. And in lust, we are ruled by our feelings and our emotions. So let me show you what this looks like in this couple's story and in this guy's struggle. And we'll see what, the, what God's Word and His Spirit have to say to, to us and for us as we are working and striving to build His kingdom. Thanks for joining us. And, Continue to invite others to do that. Loving discipline versus lustful desires. And those lustful desires specifically that we're talking about, although we mentioned last week there are many, uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 19, if you want to go find that list, um, we mentioned that the main, one, main ones we're dealing with are the ones that are most prevalent and most destructive, and that's pornea and pornography. All right? First thing I tell people, I'm sharing with them, is when we're dealing with these kind of issues, we must be, all of us must be brutally honest with ourselves. If we are to live as Christ's disciples and build His kingdom in loving relationships, if we are not brutally honest with ourselves, Paul said in Galatians 6, don't deceive yourself because whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. We've talked about that before. And by the way, he said God can't be mocked. We can convince everybody that we're sowing in something good, and when the fruit comes up and reveals what it is, God is faithful. He can't be mocked. So we need to be brutally honest, and the only way we can do that is to make sure, first of all, that we understand His truth and His Word and are guided by His Spirit. We're going to see that throughout these two, uh, th these two stories today, essentially. All right. Um, I, I do have to say this, though. As I share this couple's story and this one man's struggles, his battle... I have to say that it is not at all uncommon. As a matter of fact, it is much too and far all too common is what I should say in our, in our culture today. And I find that even with many, as probably 80 to 90 percent of those that I, that I sit with and that I meet with have grown up in church or been in church, and yet they're still living in this. It's, it's just far too common. And so there's, we've got to be missing something. And, and I hope that what we talk about today and continue to talk about not only will help us battle this, but help us see what God's love truly is and how we can overcome the pornea, the porn, the lust, the selfish desires, the pride, and the destruction that comes from that, those sins. This couple had been in my office many times, and while there had been some improvement, it was still evident that there was a lot of tension and struggle still going on. They were middle-aged, and they had met online. That's really interesting because they were probably, at this point, near the end of middle age, okay? They were nearing retirement, but they met online. After previous marriages, he had lost his uh, wife after 33 years of marriage to health issues. She had lost her marriage due to drugs and abuse and affairs. They met, and the husband admittedly attended a long-term residential sexual addiction pornography treatment program. And he, again, he admitted that he just did it so that they could move on, get married, and start having sex. That, again, not uncommon. 
we know we shouldn't have sex before we're married, so let me get through any of the issues, or at least act like I am, so we can get back to having sex. Something missing there, and we'll find out. Not surprisingly, the problems had continued, and most of them were centered on pornea and its devastating, far-reaching effects. It touches, and it destroys everything that it touches. They were sitting in my office on the brink of divorce, and neither one of them wanted that because they did want to do what the Lord wanted to do. They wanted to honor Him. So we established early on, I met with Him individually, and then I met with them together, and we established some accountability practices and placed blocks on it. I wish I had my phone here. I'd hold it up on the phone and on the computer screen and any kind of magazines or anything else. I have a, I have a friend of mine that will send me Sports Illustrated, okay? I don't read it much anymore, but... Occasionally I will, but every year in February, I think it is, there's this swim shoot, swimsuit issue, right? I'm going to say it because it's true. You can disagree with me if you want, but I'm going to say it because it's true. It's pornography. It's literally pornography, all right? And every man who gets that will tell you what goes on in his mind when he looks at that. So my wife has permission when that comes in to immediately toss it in the garbage can. That's just one of the things we do. I don't ever miss it. I, don't, I go, wow, wonder what I missed this year in February in the swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated. No. So we put accountability and blocks on everything that he had, going so far as to exchange a smartphone for a flip phone with no internet access. Now, you know a guy's serious when he does that because there's a lot of, of amenities and advantages that you can have with a smartphone, but there's also some risk, as we're talking about. So after several meetings, things were looking up and they were improving, but one day, before they arrived for a scheduled meeting, I, I received a text from her. She knew he was still looking at porn, and she was done. She had, now, if you're watching this, you'll see my quotations, but if you're listening to it on the podcast, I'm doing quotation marks with both my hands, right? She caught him that day. So, unbeknownst to him that she had texted, he's on his way home from about two and a half hours away that day. He traveled around in his job. And he's on his way home, and he calls, and I see it's him, and I pick up and say, hey, what, what's going on? He goes, I don't want to go home today. Now, he didn't know that I already knew what she was thinking, okay? So I just said, well, tell me why. What's going on? Well, I know it's going to be more of the same. And here it was, accusations, angry words, fighting, and then isolation. That was the usual pattern. Again, not all that uncommon, and especially when pornography and pornea is in a marriage and in the mind of one or both. So they came in, sat down, and they began to recount the day's events. And her revelation, and, and he already knew this, and I, I just let them talk, was that at 2.30 in the morning, she had gotten up and found him on the computer. Well, what was her immediate thought? That's why she had caught him, right? I'm doing the, ex, the quotation marks again for you podcast listeners, okay? And, and, and she knew that that's what he was doing. What else would you be doing at 2.30 in the morning when your wife's asleep, right? Well, he guaranteed her that that was not the case, but it didn't help because she was convinced that he was still actively pursuing the pornography and had just found ways to hide it. So I asked her a very simple question, and this is something that, that helps oftentimes. Over the past three months that we've been going through this specifically, had you found, have you found any evidence at all that he's seeking and using pornography? She couldn't produce any, and she thought about it for a moment and said, no, I can't. And I said, if he were still doing it with the way you have been looking for this, you would have found it. Okay? It was obvious from his slumped posture and his downcast look that he was a beaten man with very little left to offer. I asked him. And, and he said to her, I've not been seeking out or pursuing or looking at porn for over three months. Now, I could tell from her woman's and her wife's intuition that there was an issue. Something was still going on. I could tell the way they were acting. I also knew that he was telling the truth because, as I said, we would meet regularly, and I had grilled him and tested him, and he had even given up the smartphone and, and bought the flip phone. So I knew he was serious about this. He really wanted it to work. I then shared what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart, and this is the thing that I want you to get out of this because there'll be many that will hear this that are in a similar situation, unfortunately. 
but I can give you something here that, that has helped many since I shared this. I began by looking at her. I kind of point because right here in my studio is my office, so I'm looking at chairs and I can remember where they were sitting. I began by looking at her and I stated, I fully believe you. I fully believe that you understand that there's something going on with him. But I also want you to know this. I believe him. I believe that he is not actively seeking and looking at pornography. She softened a bit because she knew that while I was gracious, I was always straightforward. I wasn't trying to candy coat it. I wasn't trying to make him feel better or her feel better or whatever or, or correct. I was just simply stating what I was very clear to me over the past three months. You see, my individual meetings had revealed that he truly desired to rid himself of this porn demon and his own mind and everything else. And he had not attempted to look at anything for nearly four months. I also reassured her, though, that I did believe that, the, that there was a struggle going on and there was tension. And that is why she and her women's intuition was noticing the frustration and the distance. He wasn't engaging in porn as the world and as uh, the enemy would have us see it. Oh, you go and, and, and intentionally go to seek for it on this computer or on your phone or you sneak in magazines or videos or whatever it may be or on a streaming service that you've got hidden. No, see, that's, that's what the enemy wants us to believe that's all it is. So if you put blocks on that, if you have accountability partners and you're doing all those things, then it's gone. By the way, remember last week, I think it was maybe the week before, if you go back and look at the last two weeks, we're, we're building on this. I talked about the group Fight the New Drug. And I explained the same thing there, that they were out there battling this big, giant issue of pornography, but they didn't mind if two consenting adults. And I asked the question, why just two? Why adults? Why human beings? If you're consenting and it's already in your mind and everybody says it's okay, then let's go on and have sex. You're still in pornea. So while you may be fighting the obvious big battle that's out there making billions of dollars, you're still losing the war because you're still condoning sexual immorality. And that's why when churches don't speak against pornea and against the sexual immorality that many of the people that are attending are living in, we're not going to get anywhere. So we continue to deal with this. So I, I, I shared with her and I reassured her that he wasn't doing that. That he had been faithful in this regard. She looked at me and she kind of softened her. She was encouraged by that remark. But remember I told you that he had lost his wife to health issues after 33 years. In the last 10 years of their marriage, they had, it had been sexless because of the health issues. And she had had no desire to attempt to do anything else. So, being the noble minister, he worked in an international ministry that if I said every one of you would probably go, oh. so I'm not going to say it, just take my word for it. He worked in an international ministry, a very good ministry, and yet to do the noble thing, instead of going out and finding another woman and having affairs, he had to meet his needs, so he chose porn. So, most of the last 10 years, he got completely addicted to it, in bondage to it. And he now realized the horrific fruit of that decision. And he was fighting the bondage and enslavement that it had placed him in. So I asked him, while you're not pursuing porn, as we just described it and defined it, you are still struggling with the videos and the photos that play over and over in your mind. Fair statement? He looked down at the floor and nodded his head. It wasn't easy. But she was reassured that he was not actively seeking and pursuing it. And she was now willing to walk through this struggle with him. Made all the difference. And it was now out. He had difficulty saying that to her, saying, these are things are going on. I'm not looking at it, but things are still there. That's what it does to us. And that's what we've got to recognize. They would now be able to do this by renewing their mind, Romans 12, 2, instead of conforming to the world, they could work at it together and by taking thoughts captive and aligning them with the truth of Christ. I'm not going to continue to give in to those photos and videos. I'm going to recognize that they do not line up with Christ's truth. They're vain imaginations, foolish ideologies, false pretenders, and I am going to continue to battle them and bring in Christ's truth in their place. That's what 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 along with the continued accountability and the blocks and the other help. 
His face softened for the first time in a long time. And he shared with her that with the Lord's help and with hers, he would get through this and be the husband that God had called him to be and the one that she always wanted him to be. It was powerful. They continued to meet with me for a while, and a few years ago, they moved out of state. And the last report I got within the last year or so is that they were living happily and joyously enjoying retirement together in the peace, the love, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what happens when you lay it out before Him, and you're brutally honest, and you allow His Word to replace that of the enemy and the world and our own flesh and desire. You can check out the full article at www.loveandlordship.com. But I want to transition now to the guy's struggle that I shared with you about in the Q&A here. This, this gentleman, this friend, mentor, mentee, sent me this email. And he has permission to be very straightforward about this. So you're going to hear some things. I won't use the words. You can fill in the blanks. But he said this in an email recently. I blankety blank bleep. He, he wrote the word. I'm doing the blankety blank beep, okay? Hate my mom for what she has done to me. Forcing me to watch porn as a seven-year-old. Who the blankety bleep does that? And, and remember what I told you earlier? I would like to say this is uncommon, but I've heard way too many stories. I've had men sit in here and go, my dad and uncle walked in when I was 12 or 13 years old, threw me a bunch of magazines and said, grow up. Unfortunately, and if it's not there, because parents and churches won't step up and teach the wholeness and the fullness of the sexuality that God gave us, we've got plenty of places the devil will do the teaching. It's out there. So my first response to him was, unfortunately, this and other similar situations, as I just described, happens far too often, so you're not alone. But before we get into the issue of porn, pornography and pornea, let me state a deeper issue here. You, first thing you have to do is forgive your mom. And here's why. As long as you are harboring bitterness and holding unforgiveness toward her, not only is the enemy using that, but you are not forgiven by God. Wow, that, that won't preach too well on Sunday mornings, will it? But it comes right out of the Bible in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you do not forgive others their sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. And he was harboring this. And I said, so when the, the struggles that you have with pornea come up, the enemy immediately takes you to what you're still holding on to. And you can't process it according to the Spirit and the Word. You process it according to the emotions of anger and bitterness and hatred. The only way you get through that is to be obedient to Christ. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Forgive her. Ephesians 4, 32 says, just as Christ has, God has forgiven you in Christ, so you should forgive one another. Doesn't matter what they've done. If I hold on to it, here's the simple fact. Then if I hold on to the unforgiveness, then anger and hatred and bitterness are used by the enemy to guide me through any process I go through, and I can't get past any of it. If I'm obedient to forgive, then the Holy Spirit guides me in the truth by letting go of those emotions, walking in the truth, and I can begin not only to forgive, but I can overcome the other issues like pornea. I begin to see them for what they really are because even if mom or dad or uncle or whoever, coach or whatever, minister, priest, whoever did that to us, we've got to let that go. We've got to put them in God's hands. And we got to be able to move forward in the forgiveness and the freedom that allows us to take the responsibility for what we've done, receive Christ's forgiveness, and walk in that kind of freedom. He went on to say this, and I want you to listen to this language of bondage to sin. I want out. I want to be free of it. I'm tired of the regret. I'm tired of feeling like I'm perpetually in this constant motion of sin or bondage of sin all day, every day. I'm tired of bouncing back and forth between happy and sad. I want to feel the joy of my salvation in Jesus. Wow. I reiterated to him, you are not alone. And because of your last statement, you are free. The question is, are you going to act on it? You see, you're, you're struggling with this idol, the sin and the bondage. And listen to this, your willing submission to it for years and especially in your early formative years, that set up a stronghold in your life. 
The only way you get through that is to flip the script and begin doing it walking in the Word and the Spirit. Take the thoughts captive as we talked about. Talk about it a minute or more. You see, and I encouraged him by saying this, you've already moved beyond the stronghold because I know you even said it, I bounce back and forth between happy and sad. So there are times when I'm not dealing with this. A stronghold, you're consistently dealing with it and you, you give into it quite regularly. A struggle is the temptation comes, but most of the time, even if you're angry and upset, you battle in a struggle and you may slip, but the most of the time you understand it's not where you want to go. Paul said it this way, every day I have to discipline my body. I still have to go through the struggles, but I don't have any strongholds because I know how to get rid of those. He didn't say that exactly, but he told us how we can get rid of those. Okay? So I said to him, the only way that you now overcome it is by continuing in Christ, in his word and his spirit, by submitting and surrendering every thought and action to Him. When the things that have, were a stronghold that you now have demolished, remember, we don't use we, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. says our weapons are not carnal in nature. They're not anger and hatred and bitterness. They're forgiveness and truth and righteousness of the Word. So if you don't forgive, you're still trying to defeat this thing that you don't want in your life with carnal, fleshly, emotional tools and you can't win but if you forgive and you take it to the Lord and take it captive Galatians 5 1 says it is for freedom's sake that Christ has set you free therefore don't go back into the sin so you choose by the truth and the spirit to move out of the carnal nature and into the spiritual nature in the word and say I will defeat this with the self-control of the spirit I will defeat this with the truth of the word I will align my thoughts with those rather than continuing to give in to them. And then you, the, the struggle has less and less of a hold, and the stronghold is demolished, and it's broken down. That's the way you overcome it. That's how you die to the old man and the new man or the new nature, the new woman or the new nature that Christ has given you when you received Him as Lord and Savior. That's what begins to, you begin to build it up and you begin to mature in that. That's why Christ could say in Luke 14, 25 through 35, why he says, I have died previously to that. I have died on the cross so that you could be saved and be in a relationship with me. And if you would be my disciple, here's what it looks like. I have to be first in your life. Nothing else can take priority over me because you know what happens if it does? You're right back into the struggle, right back into the strongholds. So I, I, I want you to understand it's your choice, but you need to make me first. That's how we overcome these things. I overcome through you as you go through the struggles, as you battle the temptations and the trials. That's the way it works. And that's why he could say this. Let me flip over here on my screen here to see what he said in Romans as well in chapter 7, verses 5 through 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. The law told me that I wasn't supposed to covet. The law told me that I wasn't supposed to be promiscuous and, and, and enter into sexual immorality or commit adultery. But my flesh wants to. And when the law says don't and my flesh wants to, we're right back at the tree of knowledge and the, and the serpent is saying, no, you don't need a Lord. Don't listen to what that truth says. You go do your own thing. The law showed us clearly what sin was. And he goes on to say in, in verse 6, or verse 7, For I would not have known, I'm sorry, but now in verse 6, But now by dying to what once bound us, stronghold, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The law still tells me what I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it in my flesh alone. I now have Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit in me, and I can take the thoughts captive, destroy the strongholds, get rid of the vain thoughts and imaginations that the earlier, younger, fleshly man desired. And he goes on to say, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. You shall not have sex outside of marriage. You shall not commit adultery. I know what it is, but my flesh likes that. So I've got to have something stronger. I've got to have the new man in me. And that's what Paul guaranteed us, and Christ has guaranteed us in the Word and by His death and by His Spirit in us. You notice? 
He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And where we mistake that is, oh good, I don't have to deal with the old. But Paul said over and over again, what I don't want to do, I do. What I know I should do, I don't do. And every single day I have to discipline this body. But he told us in many places, I don't discipline in myself. I already found out what that was like with the law and the old man. I can't win. I discipline it in the Word and the Spirit every day. That's how I have overcome and Christ has overcome in me. You notice there's a clear contrast between God's truth and Satan's lies and deceptions. That's what the law pointed out. But I still couldn't win until I had Christ and His Spirit in me. The enemy's lies appeal to my flesh, and it is impossible to overcome unless we know God's truth. Let me say that again. It is impossible to overcome and win this victory unless we know God's truth. We need to be in His Word and in prayer, in relationship and discipleship with other believers so we can know His truth and overcome it by the presence and the power of His Spirit making that truth real in us, not giving in to the lies, the deceptions, and our fleshly desires. He doesn't do it by magic. He does it by maturity. By asking us to discipline ourselves and participate in knowing His Word through our own love and desire for Him. Let me say that again. He doesn't do this by magic. He doesn't go, okay, old man gone, new man in. He asks us, and He does it by our own maturity as He asks us to discipline ourselves and participate in it, knowing the Word more and more every day through our own love and desire for Him. So what desires are you feeding? What disciplines, good or bad, have you developed or are you developing right now? It makes all the difference as to whether we are walking out our faith in His Spirit or satisfying and enslaving ourselves to our selfish desires in the flesh i got six action items you can get, and all these are in the article, okay? Number one, be brutally honest with yourself as to what your thought life consists of and where it's leading you. Be brutally honest with yourself as to what your thought life is and to where it's leading you, because it always does. Number two, confess and or journal those thoughts as you and as the enemy brings them to your mind, because that's what tends to happen. You open the door, he comes barging in. Number three, go find the scripture that counters the selfish, prideful thoughts that have entered in. Remember what I told the, young, the man I was talking with and mentoring? Number four, confess those sinful thoughts as they only destroy. And then as you find that scripture, replace those thoughts and actions with God's truth. Now, what am I implying in all that? Well, I'm actually going to say it. You need to be in His Word. You need to be in prayer. You need to be in the Spirit, seeking Him, to know Him and love Him. That's what makes this possible. Number, number five, pray for the Lord to bring, as you seek and ask for, a more mature same-sex accountability partner. Don't go falling for the lie. It's okay to have that friend to get into intimate, emotional, spiritual discussions with someone of the opposite sex. Ask the Lord to bring someone who's more mature of the same sex who in accountability to help you with all of this, to walk through all of this. And then number six, over and over again, pray and thank God every time you choose His truth and love over your lust and pride. And confess and ask Him to forgive when you miss it. You need help? Contact us at Love and Lordship. Uh, you can find us at lovingmordship at gmail.com or uh, my, my, my cell phone is 859-229-6504. We'll be glad to help you walk through this as we do with many others. Uh, again, the great, there's great resources on these issues that are in the full article at www.loveandlordship.com. We ask to continue to pray for us. Update, we needed $25,000 in mid-year to get through the rest of the year. We've raised about 18000 of that. So praise the Lord. And if you are led by the Spirit to help, then please do so. But please pray for us. Uh, we reach thousands through our email and through this Love and Worship Live and in other venues every week. And so everybody just says, Lord, what would you have me do? And if he doesn't you say, join them, then don't. But if he does, find out what he would have you do. We'd love to have you partner with us. Love and Lordship is here to help you live joyfully and have fulfilling and healthy relationships in the love and Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
We don't charge for any of this. So call us. It's a safe place, and we'd love to be in partnership and relationship with you. We desire to make disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ in His love and lordship in every home and every church. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks, most of all, always to the Lord. Have a great day, and God bless in Christ.